conclusión de este eh, trío de cracks de la preservación de la cadera. Adelante, Juan. Muchas gracias, Bernardo. Un honor también para mí que introduzcas el webinar vos como referente en, en Latinoamérica y, y conocido también en muchas partes del mundo en preservación de la cadera. Yo voy a pasar ahora a hablar en inglés para facilitar la comunicación con los conferencistas. Uh, dear friends, uh, good evening. My name is Juan Gomez Hoyos, he preservation surgeon from Colombia. Today, I'm honored to moderate the masterclass in hypertroscopy, showcasing insights and expertise from three icons in the field, Dr. Thomas Sampson, Dr. Hal Martin, and Dr. John Orona. While they may remain humble and shy away from being labeled as icons, the definition is crystal clear. An icon is a person widely admired for their significant influence in a particular field. And I think we all agree that they are worthy of this title. Our speakers today are pioneers in hip preservation, having initiated their practices several decades ago with over a century of combined experience among them. This webinar provides a unique opportunity to access a wealth of knowledge hard to found in one setting. The, the objective of, this organize, of organizing this webinar in collaboration with Akar Anisha is to ensure that individuals embarking on a journey in heat preservation across the world understand that the challenges they face are part of the journey. Indeed, we are probably in the golden age of heat preservation with advanced understanding tools, implants, and solid scientific societies. Imagine how hard it was to start a heat preservation practice in the 80s or the 90s limited understanding, lack of specialized tools and implants, absence of heat preservation societies, and many colleagues calling you crazy. It is important to be grateful to those who pioneered the field and faced adversity and did not give up. Our team speakers are here to recount their journeys and impart invaluable lessons. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first conference is by Dr. Thomas Sampson. Uh, a visionary in heat preservation surgery. Dr. Sampson's main role in establishing heat arthroscopy as the gold standard in America is unmistakable. His passion for heat preservation ignited during the mentorship of Jim Glick, the father of heat arthroscopy in America, and, and Dr. Sampson's innovation in developing the lateral approach revolutionized access to the central compartment necessitating collaboration with industry to pioneer specialized equipment. Through the 90s, he helped to develop several technique, techniques as capsulotomy and femoroplasty and femoroacetabular impingement. Currently, Dr. Sampson serves at the Veterans Administration Hospital specializing in hip arthroscopy and anterior total hip replacements. Now, I invite Dr. Sampson to share his insights on his journey and contributions to transforming hypertroscopy from a criticized technique to a gold standard in the world. Please, Dr. Sampson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Juan. And I want to thank Juan Gomez and Bernardo Aguilar. Uh, so you just, you all know who are watching this tonight is that we are all good friends. And that's where we founded ISHA the International Society of Hip Arthroscopy, now Hip Preservation, based on friendship. And we hope that any of you who want to do this will become our friends as well. So um, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about my journey. And I'm gonna talk slowly because of the translation. And indeed, I didn't want to do hip arthroscopy when I was hired in 1982. These are my, um, I don't really have any conflicts right now. And um, I didn't really want to do it. Uh, I was hired to do hip. I was hired to be a, a total joint revisionist. And but before we get into that, let's just kind of start at the end here. Uh, let's talk about what we currently can accept in hip preservation. And I hope it gives many of you who are reluctant to do it the impetus to do this because it's a wonderful thing to do to preserve a hip and not have to replace it. So hip arthroscopy is worldwide accepted now. And the treatment of FAI or femoroacetabular impingement 
is pretty much everything we do in hip arthroscopy. There's other things we obviously do, like loose bodies and things like that. But 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 FAI is really what revolutionized what we do. Let me go backwards a little bit. Sorry, these are skipping a little bit. Um, it's just skipping this one slide. Let me just hit this one. Okay. So before I get into what brought us here, the future of hip preservation is, is fantastic. Um, you're all young enough to be able to go into the science of cartilage and you'll be able to change genetics with CRISPR. You'll be able to change morphologic problems. I think you're gonna be able to prevent arthritis even before my lifetime ends. And it's all based around FAI. You're able to repair the labrum. You're able to reconstruct it. Um, you can probably refine different types of cartilage damage and refine what you're going to be treating. And I think you're going to be able to preserve the holy grail, which is cartilage. So the first traction device kind of looks like our shoulder traction. This is us in 1977 when I was doing my first hip arthroscopy with Dr. Glick as a resident. And since then, and you can see it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's done with ropes and pulleys. And on the right side is the shoulder, the left side is the hip. We just took it from the hip, I mean, from the shoulder. But now you have new tools. You've got computers, the internet, 3D printing, and all kinds of stuff. And then you also have tools to do computer-assisted surgery, which is not quite uh, as prevalent in hip preservation just yet. But stay tuned. I think you're all going to be doing that in the future. And then, as I mentioned before, you're going to have all these genetic um, scissors that you can cut and paste different parts of genetics to get rid of the bad stuff and give us the good stuff and create um, create cartilage. So early on, it wasn't accepted. I mean, these three people on the top of the screen are really the people you should, you know, worship in the in the halls of the history of hip arthroscopy. And the one in the middle, you probably don't even know, but the one on the right is my partner James Glick who got me into doing this, dragging me, and I was kicking and screaming, not wanting to do it. Berman never really did a hip arthroscopy other than on a cadaver, but he's credited with the early hip uh, arthroscopies. And then down below is the three people, myself on the left, Tom Bird, middle, and Jim Glick on the right. And I think that it was Tom Bird who was also very academic and also promoted doing more meetings along with Jim Glick that really got this whole thing going in the early 1990s, and he's the one who repopularized the supine approach. So that's where the beginning started. And how we got started was just had to figure out a technique. We had to create instruments. We had to develop traction. Um, we also had to deal with other problems like complications and insurance didn't pay and people sued us if they didn't get a good result because it was experimental. My, my chief at UCSF say, why look through a keyhole when you can open the door? That's from Bill Murray. And then here I came after, I actually started doing this as a resident in 1977 as an intern and then again in 1981. But Jim Glick is the one who really pushed this forward and he's really should be credited with really getting us going. And then we developed the lateral approach together and we figured out a better way to do it. The supine approach that Jim had tried just failed. He couldn't get in. So since I was trained as a lateral hip surgeon, I figured, well, maybe there's a better way to do this. So we developed the lateral approach and we went and got a cadaver, figured out the portals and the rest is history. So we published on it and people got interested. Primarily the first things we did with it is take out loose cement from total hips. Um, this patient here, you can see that we published uh, the first 11 cases where she was very obese and she had arthritis already, but we didn't care. We did had to figure out what we can do with hip arthroscopy. This is the first, uh, <laughs> the first mechanical pump. It's me in the middle there sitting on a three liter bag, adding more pressure for Jim Glick. I'm still sterile, but <laughs> I'm sitting on the bag to give more pressure. And that was the first fluid pump in 1981. But then uh, Zimmer came up with another pump. We then worked on this cannulated system because we had to be able to get in the central compartment, which we called the intraarticular space, so we had to develop longer instruments and we developed them so you could work close together. So it was hard enough to get in. We made them close together. And even, I think, um, I think that uh, Joe McCarthy, even to the day he retired, still used this technique where the instruments are close together and they're long. 
And I think John O'Donnell used this technique as well. And we also had to prove that we were getting in the right place. So we had to use the C-arm. You know, when I trained, we had, uh, we didn't have a C-arm. We had x-ray or we had Polaroids, but we had to be able to get in. And so we needed some proof of that. We needed long instruments. And so nobody made them. Uh, there were some, some of the early arthroscopic uh, instruments, like the ones that you operate through the center of a straight scope uh, that was developed by Schneider back in the 1970s were long, but not, and they were mostly from GI uh, surgery, but we had to develop long instruments, long graspers. And then we also had to prove to everybody that we could see and do what we do. So we had to develop uh, documentation. And so this has been the way I've been documenting ever since I started doing this. Um, and the I always call them my orange sheets because I would draw out what I did. And I learned that from doing six months of hand surgery where you, you drew as a hand surgeon. And then um, having pictures that you can keep in your record or show the patient. I always gave them to the patient. And also because I think in terms of pictures, I want to be able to see what I did. And then I could tell the patient exactly what I did by looking at the pictures instead of looking at the writing. We also figured out which was too much or too little distraction. Um, Tom Bird once said, you don't need to make mistakes. You can just read about the ones I've made. I may not have quoted that correctly, but um, unsafe distraction was too much or too little. If it's too, too uh, little, you're gonna scratch the head. And if it's too much, you're gonna hurt the sciatic nerve. And we showed how you can hurt the sciatic nerve. And you, you can also hurt the pudental nerve. And this is from an early article where we showed iatrogenic damage to the sciatic nerve and also to the the uh, um, the, the structures in the perineum. And in the early days of doing hip arthroscopy, we had a 16% complication rate. I mean, I wouldn't do surgery these days if I had a 16% complication rate. And now over you know thousands and thousands of cases plus worldwide literature, the complication rate is probably close to 0.5% or even less. But these are all the can read the complications that we had. And, you know, Ricky Villar used to talk about when you're padding the perineum, you know, you want to make sure that you don't lacerate the vagina or you lacerate the scrotum. So um, he had a, an entertaining way to talk about that. So the we also looked at the evolution of our complications, the first decade, second decade, third decade, and now we're in, in the fourth decade. And the types of complications we had which we were criticized about uh, were different in the different decades. And we had rudimentary loose body removal and labral excision or labral surgery in the beginning. And that was the first decade. In the second decade, we did more advanced procedures. And that's when we started getting more time with, you know, in traction, more time with fluid. We had fluid extravasations into the belly. And in the third decade, because we had really advanced procedures in FAI, was then known that we could do it arthroscopically, we started having things like dislocations because we do a capsulotomy or capsulectomy. Then there was the argument, really not an argument, but it used to be in courses, I was invited to talk about the lateral approach and Tom Burr was talk, talked about the supine approach. And that's no longer really a debate anymore. I think it just depends on where you are and where you're trained. And I say to patients, just like with hip replacements, have the surgeon do what they're best at. And I still teach the residents how to do it lateral, but they learned from my colleague at UCSF to do it supine. So this is kind of a neat little pedigree. And I've highlighted some in individuals like myself in the, mid in the top and the middle. And then as you go to the left, Ricky Villar and, and Dorfman in France influenced, you know, Asia, I'm sorry, Europe and, and Africa. And then in the middle, uh, McCarthy influenced uh, uh, John O'Donnell, who influenced Australia and all of Asia. And you can see the, you know, the pedigrees there and, and the supine approach, you know, Dr. Bird, uh, you know, who tried to get people to do the supine approach influenced, you know, Michael Deans in Germany, Mark Philippon in the US. And then I put Hal Martin, because Hal Martin was his first fellow. And Hal Martin has influenced the world with what he does and also the posterior um, and posterior hip pain. So that's kind of a neat little pedigree. And in 20 years from now, this will no longer exist. And, you know, one, one's going to be at the top of this list in all of Central and South America and, and 
uh, Dr. Aguilera is going to be in there as well. So we'll all be gone by that point. So I think the supine approach has won the war between supine and lateral. Um, but I think if you are influenced by these people, you will do what is more comfortable. If you're not comfortable doing it one way, try it another way. So years ago, we were told that it's procedure looking for indications. And I know this is a small, very dense slide, so don't try to read it. But uh, suffice it to say that we had fewer indications in the early days, and we have a lot of indications these days. And with FAI, we have even more indications. And um, with what Dr. Martin has really taught us is about posterior hip pain and sciatic nerve entrapment. It's even more. So in the next probably 10 or 15 years, this list is going to even become larger. You know, we weren't doing hamstring and gluteus medius repairs years ago, arthroscopic. We we're doing iliopsoas release, but not those. And those are now being done as an arthroscopic technique. So, you know, my journey really um, accelerated when we realized that you could treat FAI, femoral acetabular impingement. We all owe a great deal of gratitude to Reinhold Kahn's. I mean, everything changed in 1999 for us. We, we had this procedure looking for indications. We didn't know how label tears occurred. He answered a lot of those questions with his group. Um, Dr. Glick came back from a conference in Montreal and shared that with me. And I said, we could do this arthroscopically. And he said, let's figure it out just like he did. 20 years before to figure out hip arthroscopy. So we figured it out and started doing it. We, we, pre we presented it and got blasted <laughs> by the AO group. How dare you do this as an arthroscopic technique? It should be done as a surgical dislocation. But all those people in that picture were critical of Dr. Glick and myself in 2003 when we presented to them. And now everyone, except for Jeff Mast, unfortunately is deceased and Dr. Gans no longer operates, but the other three, it, all are doing arthroscopic surgery for the same reasons that they criticize us for. But they were worried that we would kill the femoral head. They were very careful about preserving the lateral epiphyseal branch of the medial femoral circumflex artery. In arthroscopic surgery, you can see it, you can avoid cutting it. They used um, laser Doppler to figure out if they had killed it with the dis dislocation. So then came capsulotomy and I had to prove that we could do capsulotomy and get a great exposure, do the same surgery and not hurt the patient. So um, let's see what's going on here, there. So we developed this, basically the way I do anterior total hips, capsulotomy, same way. And just had to teach, learn and teach how to recognize the structures of the external part of the capsule arthroscopically. This is all done as an arthroscopic surgery, not as an open. But you can see, you see the same structures as the open procedure. And it just gave us really good exposures. And we developed the, in, the out to in capsulotomy for an ideal exposure to do our surgeries to see it. We wanted to be able to see things as well as you do as an open technique. And so for any of those in the audience who don't want to do hip arthroscopy because you can't distract, you can't see, learn this technique. And we can tell you people who are in, in Central and South America who do this technique, if you need to find out or learn how to do it, it really makes it a much easier procedure. You can see where you get really great views of the hip. I typically will look all the way, do the capsule all the way down to the intertrochanteric line, all the way above the labrum, and we get these views. So on the left is the open surgical dislocation. On the right is my arthroscopic view through a capsulotomy with, after doing femoroplasty. And we then developed a technique to do the femoral plasty. We, in the early days, we took more bone off. Now we take much less bone off. Uh, we don't want to create a really steep slope. We learned how to look at these, uh, the hip fluoroscopically before and after, so we could prove to ourselves that we took off enough bone and also make sure there's no more conflict. There are programs. I know Stryker has a program you can pay money to use the, the serum with, I don't use it. I tried it and I found that it didn't help me that much more, but again, can help some of you if you need to, to see if you're taking enough bone off. We did have some dislocations. I've had three <clears throat> and, you know, um, this is somebody who I 
did right after I gave a lecture on capsulotomy without complications and then went back and did surgery and bilateral and she popped out. We put her back in and she's never dislocated since. The literature um, has been wonderful. It's been vast with Tom Bird's book starting in 2003. I tended to get the hard subjects on decision-making. You know, if you have arthritis, how much arthritis can you have to, to do the surgery? Research was just launched. It's, it's, it's robust. The literature is dense these days. There's a ton of literature on, on hip preservation. Mark Philippon really was one of the major contributors to literature and he you know, was with Freddie Fu. Unfortunately, Freddie Fu passed away. But everybody, you know, except myself, <laughs> both John and Hal are, are robust in their contributions to literature. Um, I remember when I first met uh, Ben Dome, he wanted to be a hip preservationist, said, if you want to do this, publish. And now he is the number one, um, he gets more articles published in the journal than anybody else these days. Um, another person you probably don't know about is Gary Paling on the far left. He was the editor of the Journal of Arthroscopy. He was a hip arthroscopist as well. He helped us get things into the literature and obviously Ricky Viller on the right. Um, the reasons many of you don't want to do hip arthroscopy or hip preservation is these patients are demanding. They'll take an hour and a half of your time as a new patient. They'll bring in the literature. They'll ask you questions. It's not just like somebody who has a torn rotator cuff or a torn meniscus, doesn't take any length of time to figure out what you do. They're demanding. You got to really want to do it. So this is a picture of, of um, Damien Griffin and John O'Donnell. The Warwick uh, Agreement is what helped us get these things paid for. The Warwick Agreement, if you haven't read it, look it up. It's free. It tells you about what is FAI, what are the algorithms on how to treat it, and when to do physical therapy, when to do surgery. It's a wonderful, um, wonderful document. And if your insurance companies are not paying for the um, hip, hip preservation, show them this agreement. It's worldwide. So education, we've been teaching about this now for a long time, really over 30 years. The hip uh, at the uh, Learning Center, at all the meetings, at ISHA. Industry was slow to start. Now they're robust. They give us a ton of money for our meetings, for, for ISHA. Um, my curiosity was what led to where I am today. I was, I'm a very curious person. And I don't want to go through all these little details here, um, but the procedures that we developed over the years uh, were because of curiosity and how to do something better. And a resident asked me, can you do that arthroscopically? Or a patient asking me, can you do that arthroscopically? And the answer was, Let's figure it out. And curiosity is what got us to, to do this um, and helped it become accepted. I think FAI is really what got it accepted throughout the world. It's a very exciting time for hip preservation. All of these people issues one of our, picture of one of our meetings. All the people down below are the ones that started it. The ones in the bottom right are the ones that started the, um, the international organization and um, you can see the people in the bottom right are, are uh, still, well, most of us are retired now. I'm still, still working at 70, almost 73, but I'm only working at the VA. So um, this is what I want to do more of in the future, which is <laughs> do a lot more hiking and biking, but I still love what I do. So I'm still working at the Veterans Administration, taking care of our vets and teaching residents and students. So that's a little introduction. And um I'm glad you've all joined us tonight, and I hope you will all consider doing this. And if you're having problems doing it, call one of us or ask one of us to see if we can help you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sampson. That's uh, mind blowing to <laughs> yeah to see to see history described by the one that made history. So thank you, thank you so much. You're so welcome. So, uh, our uh, next conference is uh, by Dr. Hal Martin. We have uh, to the privilege. Let me let me change let me change something here. Sorry. So, uh, Dr. Hal Martin is next. We have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Hal Martin, a distinguished figure in hip preservation surgery and renowned for his prolific contributions as both an, an author and a surgeon, 
Dr. Martin's expertise extends to the management of intra and extraarticular pathologies, making him preeminent authority in the field. Commencing uh, his practice in 1991, he's well recognized for his profound understanding of anatomy, biomechanics, and extraarticular pathologies. Dr. Martin currently divides his time between Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Cape Cod, where he focuses on research, education, and RTP consultancy. His expertise in extraarticular hip pathology is unparalleled, and all hip surgeons will be forever thankful that he didn't give up on his dreams so we could help, help, help hopeless people uh, with now clear diagnosis and treatment, treatments that didn't exist before. Dr. Martin has prepared a presentation for us titled Extraarticular Hip Pathology, sharing my experience in pioneering a new frontier in hip preservation and overcoming resistance to change. Please, Dr. Martin, we anxiously await your insights. Hey, Juan. Um... Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm just um, opening my slides now to my screen. Just please let me know when you can see it. Uh, can you see it now or? Not yet, not yet, doctor. Okay. You go to share screen. Um, yeah, I've got it on the share screen. I'm just trying to see if it'll come up there one. See. So while Dr. Martin uh, fixes the the sharing screen, uh, please, if you have any question for the final discussion, you can share that in the chat. You just ask the question in Spanish, or in Spanish or English, so we will be able to select some questions for the for the final part of the webinar. What are you um, seeing it now at all? I'm gonna have to go to John. I don't know if that... So if you if you're more comfortable with that, I can ask John O'Donnell to do his conference, and then you can. Sort that out. Do you uh, want that? I think so. I don't know uh, why it's not uh, moving forward to you right now. I just wanted. But, but we'll be more than happy to to listen to you a cappella if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's probably about the same. So it's, uh, uh, but it should be coming across. It shows it from me, um, but you're not seeing it. Hmm. So you see the share screen button at the yeah. at the bottom of the oh, yeah. of, of the screen. Yeah, it's I've got it on and it shows then, my. So, the, so you select you select the window. Yep, got your it. presentation and then click share. Yeah, I think you might want to just go ahead and have John do it. I'll see okay. if I can figure out what's going on here. Okay, so well, Dr. Martin uh, figured that out. So we're gonna continue with Dr. O'Donnell. Uh, he's a leading uh, hip surgeon globally, renowned for his extensive experience in performing hip arthroscopies. His expertise encompasses understanding the causes of arthroscopic failures and effective strategies for addressing them. Dr. O'Donnell embarked on his journey in hip arthroscopy in 1992, dedicating himself now to non arthroplastics hip surgery. Presently, he practices at St. Vincent Hospital in East Melbourne, Australia where he remains at the forefront of advancing excellence in hip preservation. Dr. O'Donnell is arguable, arguably one of the hip surgeons with the most hip arthroscopies performed in his record. Therefore, his lessons are incredibly valuable. Dr. O'Donnell is, to give, is, to, is going to share insights gleaned from decades of practice in reaching our understanding of the complexities within hip arthroscopy. Please, Dr. O'Donnell, if you want to share your screen, we are all ears. Thanks, Juan. Thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully, I'm having more success than Hal was. Uh, it's very kind of you to ask us to be a part of this. As you can see from this uh, slide uh, of the ISHA meeting in Melbourne in 2018, uh, 
I, I should have you in at one, but unfortunately you weren't in this one. But we all go back a long time and we've been friends for a long time and supported each other for a long time as well. Uh, when I was first doing work on the League of Mandem Terries, Hal was the major person who really stuck, kept, got me to stick at it. And we did quite a few things together back in those days. I'm sure everyone knows where Australia is. Well, maybe. And the red dots, Melbourne, down the bottom where I am. You can see we're kind of together in South America compared to everybody else. It's like we're fenced in compared to the rest of the world. And these are pictures of Melbourne at the top and uh, and the river, which doesn't usually look blue. It's actually quite brown. And the hospital where I work. I have been practicing hip arthroscopy. This, this is the only disclosure I want to make since 1992. It's all I do now. I used to do hip replacement as well and previously did shoulder surgery, but they've all stopped now. So it's just hip arthroscopy. And I stopped counting at 10,000, so I'm guessing that. But yeah, so there's been a lot of them. In terms of what I've learned, I think there are a few general thoughts that I wanted to put out there, which I hope are helpful to people who are starting particularly and maybe getting discouraged at times. It, and I find hip arthroscopic surgery to be really enjoyable these days. It's not something I get stressed about. Uh, and there's a few things that I hope that uh, may be helpful to you that uh, I can pass on. And a few things that, that I've done that I would strongly suggest that you should learn from my mistakes. So this has always been my favorite quote. Uh, it's attributed to Isaac Newton and an English physicist in 1675, that if I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. And in fact, he didn't say it, he stole it from someone else. And it was a Frenchman who I think is about the earliest person who have said something very, very similar. And he even has a stained glass window in the cathedral at Chartres. Uh, which you can see down here on the on the side with a with a guy sitting on a, on a giant shoulders and that's in the stained glass there now and that uh, the quote dates back to the 12th century so it goes back a long time and i think the importance of it is that many people have come before all of us we can learn and like tom said about thomas bird you don't have to make all the mistakes yourself you can read about some of them and learn from others These are some of the giants I learned from. This was the first meeting of what became Isha, 12 people just getting together in Paris in 2008. And the arrows are on Rick, Ricky Villa, Joe McCarthy and Thomas Bird. But in fact, I've learned from everybody in this picture and plenty more besides and go on learning still today. More importantly, I've made more friends through hip arthroscopy than anything else. Uh, Ricky Villa down there on the left, who's dragged me through the mountains in the Lakes District of uh, of the UK, tried to kill me, I think. Uh, the, there's a gathering of fellows who, in 2018, when we had the Isha meeting in Melbourne, they came from all around the world to be a part of that. And Tom Sampson, who's become one of my really great friends, and his lovely wife, Jill, there, who we do, that might even be the same hike you were talking about earlier, Tom, I think. So we've hiked together in all sorts of weird and wonderful places. I think before you start, there's a couple of things that are really important. Uh, hip arthroscopy is not like knee arthroscopy or even shoulder arthroscopy, although it has a lot more in common, I think, with shoulder arthroscopy. Certainly, I've found it far easier to teach surgeons who have a background in shoulder arthroscopy than surgeons who have a background in hip replacement. They, so they have an idea of the concepts better and the skills that are required. And just because you can do operations on the knee or the shoulder or other joints doesn't mean you can do hip arthroscopy straight away. So don't just go into it thinking, yes, I can do this. I've seen people who've tried that method and it goes really, really badly. And you can't learn it from a book. So learn from people who know, who've already been through a whole lot of the errors, who can teach you to avoid them rather than make them go to lectures and courses they're helpful in getting the theory behind it i've always found cadaveric courses to be the best because it's a skill that you can't just read about you have to practice 
I think virtual surgery is fine and it's helpful, but I don't think it's a full answer yet. But what I've always found most helpful is to visit expert surgeons. If you have the option of doing a fellowship, that's terrific, but a lot of people don't have that possibility. Doing cases with someone else, uh, I've always found to be an excellent thing to do. I still do it now. And I still learn things every time from other people. And the other part I learn from is people visiting me because they ask me questions that make me stop and think about what I'm doing. So much of it's habit now, and it's good to be, be called up. And there's a lot of terrific hip surgeons in South America. So those of you in South America have plenty of people to visit uh, and learn from. And, you know, they are really excellent, uh, excellent teachers down there. So my early cases uh, were difficult, a bit like Tom, we had to make it up as we went. So I had a senior colleague who I worked with who taught me knee arthroscopy and shoulder arthroscopy, and he'd actually done two hip arthroscopies, but he said he would never do another one because it was so hard, and he strongly advised me not to try. And I had Tom Sampson and Jim Glick's paper, which was the one that Tom showed you before. So I read that, and that was basically all I had, and the rest of it I had to kind of figure out by myself. So that was Tom and me. Uh, you know, we've got lots of hiking pictures. I promise not to show you any more. But, uh, but it is wonderful to have friends who you can talk about all your, all your problems, not necessarily you know, at a meeting, but at times when you're just relaxed and together, I find that's when I learn most because people are, are very happy to share their experiences. So this was how I started. We had an old fracture table. We put a bit of extra padding on the post. I didn't have a lateral setup in those days. Uh, we sort of had a bit of a guess where to put the portals because uh, that seemed to work on cadavers. Uh, I didn't use that very anterior portal, but that was more a marker to say, don't go that far. And we mainly used those two just at the front and back of the, of the trochanter. We had longer telescopes. They were old Smith and nephew uh, videoscopes. Uh, we had a, said some curved shavers, uh, a flexible cannula. It needed to be flexible to get the curved shaver down it. We had some modified diathermies, which were pretty crude, and we had knee instruments, and that was about it. But that was terrific compared to this guy. So Bernie Inoda, who's in the picture with me there, in 1978 did the first hip arthroscopy in Australia, and that was to remove a piece of broken cement from a hip replacement where the hip replacement had dislocated and they couldn't relocate it properly because a piece of cement had broken off and was blocking the reduction. So he was asked, would he, did he feel he could remove this with an arthroscope? He was doing the arthroscopy at that time. And so he made these instruments himself. The pituitary rongeur obviously existed, but all of the others he made himself in his back shed and sterilized them and did the operation and successfully removed the pieces of cement and uh, things took on from there in our country. But you do need adequate instruments. I think making them in your back shed is not really a possibility anymore. Be properly set up. Trying to make do with poor instrumentation is a really bad idea. The operation is hard enough at times anyway and good instrumentation is critical to making it as easy as possible. I think when you're starting, it is really helpful to have good patients. And a lot of people I know thought that they would start with people with arthritis. And I think that's a really bad idea. Firstly, you probably shouldn't be operating on them anyway in the majority of cases because hip arthroscopy is not a great operation for arthritis. And they tend to be quite stiff. And they also tend to have a lot of pathology. And so to try and do that when you're first starting, I think is really, really difficult and I would strongly suggest you don't do it. I think women tend to be easier to operate on because they tend to have more laxity and they can distract their hips more easily. You get a better view. They the pathology tends to be smaller often. Operating on cams is, is fine, but try to choose them when they're not too big and too extensive uh, because that gets quite difficult as well. I think joint arthroscopy in any joint, the, the key to it being able to do it properly is to be able to see well. And if you don't have excellent visibility, I was taught if you can't see it, you can't fix it. And I think there's a lot of truth in that remark. 
I think start with a technique that is simple, reproducible, and allows most procedures. There are many, many techniques that people have for doing hip arthroscopy, almost as many techniques as there are surgeons. But I think learn one, choose one that suits you, and then develop your own uh, changes from that, but start with something that's very, very standard. My problem always was to be scared of traction. And I know Tom talked about too much, but I think you're far more likely to get into trouble with not enough. So the picture on the top left is uh, in a hyperlax patient. So you wouldn't normally expect to have that degree of distraction and indeed you don't want it. Uh, but so we took some traction off after seeing that and we had very little to start with. Uh, sometimes you find that with the deformity of the hip, such as this old Perthes, that, and with a high trochanter, it can be quite hard to get into the hip and you need to actually plan how you're going to do it. I think often in that situation, having less abduction of the hip is really helpful because abducting the hip raises the, the greater trochanter and tends to block off your pathway into the hip. And the picture is of a posterior portal, which is often quite tight. And you can see when there is little room to, to move, it's so easy to cause damage to either the articular cartilage or to penetrate the labrum or do other or cause other problems. So I think adequate traction is really important. These are the portals I use. This is a live person, but she's just set up as if she was in a lateral position. I just have these two very simple portals, one at, on top of the midpoint of the trochanter and one about three centimeters off the front of the femur. And I use that for the great majority of what I do. And I don't swap portals around. I just keep the telescope in the mid one. And in the great, great majority of patients, that is very adequate. So this is what we see. Is it, and so Tom showed a picture that showed something very similar with the telescope and the instruments in the front. I think it's important. Don't angle your telescope in too far forwards at the start. You'll be hard up against the anterior wall of the acetabulum and it's hard to see you need to be back a little and getting a field of view. It's hard to make sense of this, but these are the two extra portals that I do use reasonably commonly. So a more distal portal for introduction of uh, drills for insertion of anchors and a posterior portal for getting to the posterior inferior part of the acetabulum. As you can see down here, we're removing an osteophyte with a chisel. Uh, I do use this more distal one for inserting the anchors because it's really important, obviously, to be diverging your drill away from the articular surface and avoid uh, drilling into the acetabulum. And it's important to have that starting angle correct. And so you need extra portals to do that. I think it's helpful that you have lateral distraction as well. So is, this is easy to achieve when you're doing the arthroscopy in a lateral position because we start with the leg widely abducted, put the bolster in, have it a little bit high. And then as we drop the leg, that will inevitably put the lever, lever the head up a little. Uh, you can see here where we were doing an operation with a postless distraction. And on the right is uh, how it looked at the start where the ligamentum teres is not distracted at all. Uh, and it's hard to see, and it's hard to pick up tears. So until I actually ask the fellow to lift up on the femoral head, uh, then that made it much easier. So I find that to be a bit of a problem with postless distraction. It's harder to get that lateral distraction as well as the longitudinal distraction. I try to avoid using cannulas as I find that they just tend to stiffen the tissue effectively and make it harder to maneuver, uh, maneuver instruments within the hip, although there are better ones now. Uh, but the stiff ones I use for tying knots and uh, passing stitches through labrums, but otherwise I don't use cannulas. And I prefer to use something like a removable half circle or less cannula, like the ones on the left, which have a, a series of, of different lengths that you can put on the same handle, or the Smith & Nephew one that Victor Elizaturi designed many, many years ago. I find tra traction stitches really helpful because I think you want to minimise the amount of capsulotomy you do. Other people like making really big capsulotomies and stitching them up. I'd rather make a smaller one and often not need to stitch it. 
This is just an example of that. You see, after we put the stitch through the, the cut edge of the capsulotomy, they're sitting there. As we lift it up, you can see in, under the capsule. And as we take the traction off as well, then that can open up that whole field of view really well with a relatively very small capsulotomy. I like to use an unhooded burr because it doesn't catch the soft tissue. Uh, and I just find that the hood tends to block my view at times. So this just allows a better view. And you can see without going on about it, but you can see with your cut bone without picking up soft tissue. Uh, and I'd much prefer to use that type of burr. The areas where I think great care should be taken are particularly hyperlaxity. I try to be, I always do a Bayton score on patients first to see if they're lax. I look for an increased range of hip movement preoperatively, increased distraction with minimal traction, as I showed before, and a thin capsule. And I find all of those things tend to point me towards someone with micro instability and hyperlaxity. This is just an example. So you see the increased distraction. On the top is a normal capsule that's been cut. And at the bottom, you see the very thin capsule in someone with hyperlaxity, where we've made a very small capsulotomy uh, to try to minimize risk with that. So there, in that situation, there are some things I do to minimize the likelihood of causing further problems later with increased instability. Minimize the size of the capsulotomy. Make it just a small dilation of the anterior uh, entry portal rather than joining up portals. Always repair wherever at all possible a labral tear. Be particularly careful not to over resect a cam as uh, losing that suction seal by having too much bone removal can be a major problem. And close the capsule carefully in these patients. Don't do this. So this was a patient who was sent to me. I've got some of my own that I'll tell you about in a moment, but you can see what's happened. So she's had an arthroscopy. That's her X-ray down the bottom uh, prior. Uh, she's had her labrum removed, the capsule not repaired, uh, it's just scarred tissue at the front and an over a section of the cam uh, in which is debatable whether it was really cam anyway, but it's certainly not now. And there's, so there's a big resection that's been done. And you can see with just minor rotation or flexion of the hip, there's this big gap in the edge of the acetabulum where there's nothing. And so there's, there's very little holding the hip in now apart from muscle. Everything else has been destroyed. And she went on to have a hip replacement at a very, very young age. I think when we first started doing labral repairs, we were all worried that they wouldn't heal. And I think pretty much everybody was very conservative at the start. And I know that I used to put people on crutches with a period of protected weight bearing for up to four to six weeks. But I pretty quickly found out that that was a really bad idea. And that led on to a, far, to a really high incidence of capsulolabral adhesions, causing pain and stiffness. And when we got MRIs of these people at that time, almost without exception, the MRI said that there was either failure of healing of the labrum or a re-tear. And so we had a small series where we re-arthroscoped them with the idea of re-repairing the labrum. But in fact, what we found was they were all healed. There wasn't a single one where the labrum hadn't healed in spite of the MRI report. And what they had was these adhesions like this band here, you can see which is attached to the labrum. So as the hip is moved, the, it, the capsule pulls on the labrum and it's painful, but it also restricts movement. And so we found that, that that was the cause of the problems, not failed labral healing and inadequate early movement greatly aggravated the likelihood of these things occurring. So we moved from that to immediate mobilization and range of movement of exercise. And Mark Philippon popularized the idea of circumduction exercises but I think it's just the range of movement that's important and getting people off crutches quickly uh, has greatly diminished the rate of uh, adhesions and these problems. The other thing I think, which I've found has helped me uh, minimize this risk is using smaller and smaller anchors with smaller drill holes. Uh, so I think that drilling into the uh, subchondral, beyond the subchondral bone and into the marrow uh, is likely to lead to very active cells getting into the, into the clots and leading to more scarring. Pincer resection, I think, is still an evolving art. Uh, how much bone do you need to resect is important. Do you need to detach the labrum? 
Uh, can we minimise post-label repair adhesions by minimising uh, the damage that we do, and if possible, by avoiding the use of anchors altogether? So this is what we try to do. If the kept, if the chondrolabral junction is intact, uh, then and not too much bone removal is required, then we leave the labrum uh, through the chondrolabral junction intact, and we do all the work behind that. So you can see this here a bit better, I think. So we're burring with an unhooded burr. The labrum's on the left. You can see it. Oh, there's labrum there. We're removing bone from behind it. The burr doesn't pick up the labrum. It doesn't cut it. Uh, and we can remove the bone from behind it. We can't leave a large area of, of articular cartilage just flapping in the breeze. But so long as there's not uh, too much bone removal required, then I find we can do this very often. And then I prefer not to put any anchors in at all uh, and just leave the, the labrum sitting, as you can see on the right. Don't worry about the movement, but this is just another case where we've done the same thing. But you can see what happens to the labrum four years later. It heals really well. The other, other point I'd really like to make is that not all CAMs are pathological. I see a lot of people who've had CAMs removed where I doubt that they were really causing much of the problem. When it's thought that perhaps 25% of men have some degree of CAM present and most will never be symptomatic, it's very easy to blame them for the problems that we might identify when in fact they're not the cause. So just because a patient has hip pain and has a CAM, it doesn't necessarily follow that the CAM is the cause of that pain, nor that removing the CAM will do any good either. Particularly beware with female patients with hyperlaxity or micro instability and what are thought of as small CAMs. So this lady had been told that she had a cam, which was this. But in fact, if you draw the circles on, you find there really is no cam. It's more this deficient bone, which is giving you an illusion of a protruding piece of bone. It's not truly a piece of extra bone at all. And I'll just finish with, uh, with an, a great error of mine. So this was back in 2012. You can see on the right that the the that this patient has a degree of uh, dysplasia and a, and a dysplastic femoral head, but which I called a cam. Uh, I removed it. This is it here. This is the area of bone that I removed. And within a year, her early degeneration had very rapidly progressed to severe degeneration and she had a hip replacement. So she would have been way better if I'd never touched her. Uh, so I think you do need to be particularly careful with people with a degree of instability. So I think learn before you start, don't learn on the job. It's really important to be able to see what you're doing. And if you can't see properly, don't just press on uh, with your eyes half closed, make sure you can see properly first. Cams are easy to see, but they're not always a problem. So be cautious before you blame them for whatever pain you're seeing. If you can maintain the chondrolabral junction during your operation, I think that's extremely beneficial. And always look for any evidence of micro instability. It's not always obvious immediately. Check carefully before you start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. John Arnold, for this wonderful conference. Uh, a lot of tips, a lot of insights from one of the most experienced hypercroscopist in the world so that's pretty that's gold thank you thank you so much uh, so our interpreter uh, asked us to have a five minutes break so I'm gonna have a question for the for our three speakers while our interpreters uh, turn the mic off and uh, and take a break and um uh, my question will be one that was posted in the chat from Ecuador, Dr. Pacheco. He's asking how many cases uh, were necessary for you to feel comfortable doing hip scopes. We can start maybe with Dr. Hal Martin, and then we have the other two speakers. Doctor or Doctor Hal Martin, can you listen to us? Yeah, yeah, I can. Can you, you listen to a question? 
Yeah, I did uh, yeah. a little bit one. You might repeat it. I was just getting ready to share my screen, but I think I can't yeah. share it right now. Don't worry. Uh, Don't worry. So so we ha we're going to have a five minutes break with our interpreter. So we're going to have uh, some a few rounds of just a question uh, with uh, you three. So my question is one that was posted in the chat. How many cases did you need to feel comfortable doing hip scopes? I guess, you know, many factors involved, including the tools that they were developing. You developed some tools I, I know I'm aware of. So please uh, enlighten us with your experience. Yeah, so I think that the technique of surgery, you know, to, to do surgery, um, it doesn't take long for us to get, if you're used to doing open surgery, uh, especially if you've done a lot of trauma, I don't think it takes a long time to get oriented uh, to the technique of arthroscopy. That was just the way it was for me. If you're familiar with the scope in the knee and the shoulder, I thought it was fairly straightforward. Um, the, the more complicated thing is understanding the anatomy in three dimensions, its interconnectedness to the sagittal plane, coronal plane, and axial plane, and how they interrelate to the pelvis, the hip spine, pelvic core. Uh, that to me is the most important, uh, how things move and function and terminal hip flexion and terminal hip extension. And then how do we diagnose these problems in a multiplanar way? so that we, every layer of the hip is covered, not just a labral tear, but what's the osseous structure three-dimensionally, what's the labral pathology, what effect does it have on muscles and tendons, uh, what effect does the muscle and tendon have on the nerve and artery, the kinematic chain, the sagittal plane balance. So to me, that's critical. The surgery is easy. Um, it's very easy. It's, uh, to me, I, I think it's an easy part of it. But to understand a plan for addressing the patient's pathology, and part of my talk, I'm kind of stealing from my slides, but I think that what's changed to us today um, is the patients have changed. So we have to have a different, how we started, you know, all, I'm so thankful for everybody, my teachers and everybody that taught me, um, you know, John and Tom and, and Mark and everybody and Michael Millis and John Hall, he, all the way back from my training. But to me, the most important thing is to have a great plan. It's just like if you see a complicated fracture, you've got to have a good drawing, a good plan, and a comprehensive understanding three-dimensionally before you walk into the OR. To me, that's hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how many cases do you have to see of that before you're ready? Um, I think you've got, to have, you, you've got to be with a mentor and see some together. Um, and I would encourage everybody to do three to six months with somebody who's done a lot, like John or Tom. And get in there, uh, get, harvest the knowledge that they have as best you can, because um, this, this time of this escalation, the way we've, this curve, this, this ramp up, um, I don't think it'll happen again. I think that this was a, we, this was, this is a rare time in history. So yeah. the patients that were willing to do it, and we had the people who understood the anatomy well with good hands to be able to address it. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, great, great answer. Thank you. So I'm going to translate for the Spanish speakers and I'll I'll be uh, back with you all. Lo que el doctor Hal Martin eh, dice y, y me parece supremamente importante es que realmente dar un número es complicado. Eh, lo que él piensa que, que es más importante es el entendimiento de la patología. No solamente analizar una rotura laboral o un CAM o un pincer, sino entender la biomecánica lumbopélvica, entender todas las capas de la cadera, entender cuál es el problema real del paciente y hacer una, un análisis integral y, y, y completo del paciente. Él dice que para él la parte técnica es lo más fácil del, del mundo de la preservación, lo más complicado es realmente el diagnóstico y el entendimiento de la, de la patología. Entonces hay que fortalecerse en anatomía, hay que fortalecerse en entender la biomecánica lumbopélvica, el core, hay que a pegársele a alguien que haga bastantes casos para poderse ayudar de la indicación y, y, y no hacer una muy buena técnica en un paciente que no la tenía indicada. Es más o menos como la idea central de lo que él nos quería decir. Que si uno ha hecho cirugía abierta de la cadera o si ha hecho artroscopia de hombro rodilla, eso le va a ayudar para tener una curva de aprendizaje. Pero en realidad él, él piensa que, que más importante que la técnica es el entendimiento de quiénes son los que se benefician y quiénes 
son los que no, y realmente tratar la, la patología real del paciente. A veces uno se enfoca mucho en, en las lesiones reportadas en resonancia, eso no lo dijo él, pero como complemento, y en realidad la patología es mucho más profunda. Uh, ok, so, uh, let's do another question. Uh, for Dr. O'Donnell, uh, someone here, Dr. Felix Castillo from Panama is asking, Uh, you prefer anchors with uh, the knots or knotless, and the risk for adhesions uh, is higher with either uh, of them. Do you think is not related? So, what what are your what is your insight about this, Doctor Olon? I use anchors with knots only because that's how I learned, and I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, I suspect that it's probably better not to have knots uh, in terms of adhesions, but we find that. We see adhesions in around 2% of people where we've done repairs now. So I think it's a small problem, but it's still there. There are a couple of things that really helped. One was having much smaller anchors. Uh, that made quite a difference. Uh, and the other was in pincers. A lot of the time now we don't use anchors at all. And so I've only ever had one patient where I've done that who developed significant clinically important adhesions. So I think... Uh, Obviously, if there's a tear, you need to repair it. But if you don't need anchors, then it's helpful not to use them. Uh, the other part of that thing was about that question was, um, when do I suspect them? I suspect them when someone seems to be doing really well following a label repair. And maybe about four to six weeks afterwards, they start to complain that they're losing some movement and they're getting increasing pain in the hip. And they're the group where I'd strongly suspect adhesions as the cause. Uh, I haven't found MRIs very helpful in diagnosing them. So what we've tended to do is uh, go on with physiotherapy, maybe inject some cortisone to try and just relieve pain. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then we re-arthroscope them. And the great majority of the people where we, almost all of the ones where we do that, we find adhesions and divide them. And then once we've divided the adhesions, we find they do just as well as if they'd never had them in the first place. Okay, great. No, so the, the translation for that would be, uh, el doctor, eh, la pregunta es si él prefería hacer reparación laboral con o sin nudo. Y él dice que él la hace con nudo porque fue como la aprendió, pero él piensa que tal vez para el riesgo de adhesiones podría ser mejor sin nudo. No obstante, en su casuística es apenas el 2% de los casos con nudos, entonces tampoco lo ve como un gran problema. Él lo sospecha en los pacientes que estaban bien después de cirugía y a las cuatro o seis semanas empiezan a tener dolor o limitación en la movilidad. Eh, y que primero les tratan con terapia física y si no mejoran, él realmente no cree que la resonancia aporte mucho. Si hay sospecha de que pueda ser una adhesión laboral por, por la historia del paciente, simplemente hacen una cirugía de revisión pues cuando lo consideran pertinente, discutiéndolo pues con el paciente. Ok, so, uh, and the last question of this section for Dr. Samson. Do you think the the evolution of hypertroscopy in the last two decades is more because of the understanding of the pathologies that we can treat or because of the tools i i i'm sure it's because of both but what what will be the percentages you will give to each one of these the, the, the of these options the the tools and the, and the understanding of the pathologies Um, my opinion is it's because of the understanding of the pathology. Um, the tools have always been there, but they've just improved. And um, But I think the understanding of the pathology is the key to why we've gone gotten into this renaissance of hip preservation, because we now know pretty much what we're treating, and we know the etiologies as to what we're treating. So case in point, when we would give advanced hip arthroscopy courses in the 1990s, the one subject that we talked about was label tears and unexplained hip pain. And probably Hal Martin can, can really relate to this and John can relate to this. <clears throat> and uh, so I think that when we understood FAI, we began to understand what caused label damage because we then understood how the pincer could destroy a labrum or a cam could destroy the labral cartilage junction and delaminate the articular cartilage. 
<clears throat> and I think we also began to understand what is a label tear and what is a label cartilage junction delamination. You know, if, I always said, if you're looking from the cartilage side, it looks like a label tear. And if you're looking from the label side, it looks like a cartilage delamination or, or tear. So I think it's more the pathology. Now the tools have significantly improved and also the way we do it has significantly improved. But the underlying, I think the underlying understanding of the pathology is what really led, has been leading to our advancement. Yeah, so we could say the the tools improved because we understand better the pathology. So we asked for new tools to treat. Exactly, and so, and before you translate, you know, I agree with John that to me, the best uh, best anchor is no anchor. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, when Mark Philippon might put in six anchors, I'll put in two, maybe three, at the most. Um, and because what we do, you know, you have to be, you have to look at the what you're trying to do. You're trying to get a labrum to stick back down and to act as a label seal. And if you can accomplish that with two anchors, or if you have cartilage that's holding it when you remove the bone, you don't need the anchor or a combination. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Thank you so much. So we don't need translation for this one because we have the interpreter back. So oh, great. <laughs> uh Dr. Martin, were you able to put the slides? It's it's not it's not you know critical because you know if you couldn't do it. So what we want really is actually this webinar was planned first as an as an interview for the three of you, but I, I will I, I I thought it would be interesting to have some uh slides. Uh, for some pictures, but in, in your case, Dr. Martin, we are mostly interested in your journey, trying to, like you were in a comfort zone doing hip scopes for, for hip impingement. So why and, and when did you decide to start a new uh, field in a very complicated space where you could find uh, big arteries, big nerves, uh, some risky uh, areas that many people don't want to get in so what did motivate you to to start this field and what were you at some point this course trying to give up or or what, what happened during this journey please please tell us when i think my slides i want to try them again because i tried to answer that question for you and i think the slides it's a complicated enough it's a complicated enough question that i'd like to try to get them to come up if i can because i think that it's worth one more try Okay, try again, Doc. Okay, let me just see. Yeah, that's not coming up. So, so, so when you, if you look at the bottom of your screen, if you, you see a green button that says share screen, do you, do you see that? Yeah, it's not coming up in my, um, on my screen though, Juan. It's not, it's, um, it says, it says basic and I've got, it says desktop and it doesn't so show. Why, so what, what, is it too heavy? Because you can, you can start talking. You send that to me via email and I can share that. It's, I send it to you. So you have it. Um, you have it. Sure. As a, so if you want to just pull it up, I think you've got it there. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it, that, that's, that's good. So I'm going to download it and, and I'm going to put it. Uh, in the share screen for you, but but if you want, you can start doing an introduction about the question okay. I just. So made. what? Yeah, I think that that's what's um, what's good here is um, is the question one. I really enjoyed the question, um, and uh, to try to figure out what is the, you know, what has been the journey on the extra articular space, and I, I'd have to say that it's been. It's been a different one. You have to understand the background of a little bit of where I've come from. You know, I I, um, I started my my training, uh, you know, at Oklahoma State, my pre med, my medical school. Then I went to. Um, you can go to the second slide there if you want. Yeah, I, I got it. Uh, or, sorry, slide show. Play, play from the start. You see it. I can see it perfect. Yeah, you just let me know when you want to go. I'll give you one of those, but uh, you can go uh, on to the next slide. Sorry, everyone, but I kind of I started, you know, at Oklahoma State, and um, that's that's from my home, and then I went to Doctors Hospital, but I had a really great thing during my training. I got to go to uh, Boston Children's uh, with John Hall and Michael Millis, 
And uh, I spent every Monday driving down to the University of Cincinnati to work with Alvin Crawford and Dennis Roy uh, at, the, at the Children's Hospital trying to understand complex cases. So I, I really enjoyed that from the beginning, trying to understand things that had a bit of a challenge to them. I, I went back to Oklahoma. I, I kind of forego a couple of fellowships for some family things. And, uh, but I went back and I joined a really great group and I got exposure to trauma and sports medicine did also something to help me to understand three-dimensional three pathology in a Lizeroff Fellowship in 95 uh, in, in Laco, Italy. Um, after that, I, I talked to Freddie about doing just a sports, fel uh, for, sports fellowship, and he wanted me to do hips. And I knew Mark from uh, when he was his time at Harvard uh, with Henry Mankin, and so went there for a year and then spent another year with he and Brian came back and taught at the University of Oklahoma for the hip pathology series, and then became the medical and research director when you joined me, uh, Juan, at Dallas. And we had a kind of an upslope uh, through understanding of those years. So you can um, take the next uh, slide there. And, and you know, what, what I did is try to organize my research, uh, looking at anatomy, biomechanics, clinical diagnostics, and outcome. And that's the way I always have, have done it all the way back since I was uh, in Boston. I felt like anatomy was the key to understanding the evolving and evolving field, and then try to apply the biomechanics to that in three planes. And that, that really helped us to help to make some papers to give some foundation for the exploration of um, you know, the posterior hip and the lateral hip, uh, which I didn't feel like we understood that well. And, uh, but it led to some publications and, and even the opportunity to help uh, with ISHA as research chair. And my goal as research chair, um, which I had opportunity to serve under some great presidents, but I just wanted to provide a shelter from the extrinsic factors so that the field could continue to grow. Now, I never really expressed that too much, but my, that was my goal. I felt like it was a, a fledgling field just beginning. And we had a lot of criticism from a lot of people in those days. And uh, I, I heard a lot of it, um, but I, I feel like that we were able to do that. So it led me to uh, working, and you can go to the next slide, and to working as a reviewer, editor, worked on some different types of things uh, to help protect the field from an editorial standpoint. And you can go on. But this is the big concept that I came through, and this is partly from Brian Kelly and Pete Dreovich, but we were all part of that conversation when this is evolving and that's the layer concept of what's happening. And so from the osseous, the capsular labral, the musculotinous, the neurovascular, and then finally the kinematic chain and Michael Millis, the big thing that's different today, the evolution. I once asked Dr. Bird, I said, Dr. Bird, do you think that hip arthroscopy would have evolved if it would have been invented today versus when you started? And he said, I'm not sure it would. That's a big statement because the world has changed because of layer six. I think that just the resiliency of the patient, the resiliency of the doctor, this has had an influence on our ability to tackle bigger and bigger pathologies about the hip as we've started to understand the interrelated complexities. So it's really a cascade of pathology that we've come to recognize from the bones to the capsule, to the musculotendinous, to the neurovascular and then the kinematic chain. But the problem that I see is that if the muscles are weak in the pelvis, that can tip your pelvis, then you can lead to impingement and then it can cascade the same pathology. So you can go from a layer three to one and then layer, layer three, one can create two. So it, it, you can have these little ebby flows instead of things cascading in a normal fashion, one, two, three, four, five, six, they can actually kind of one layer can affect the other, but you have to have a plan and a structure for addressing all the pathologies. And if you don't, then we will get, be criticized that we induced a pathology that was there from the beginning when we did not. So that's the reason a comprehensive examination has to be a part of it. And um, so here's what I came up with. When you asked me the question, I thought it was a fantastic question. What I've struggled greatly with it, um, you know, uh, trying to understand as societies change and cultures change, what can, what can we do to help people with complex problems? And at Baylor, this became its own qu complex question, as you know one. But there are intrinsic factors and there are extrinsic factors in this developing field. I think that there's intrinsic factors are things that you and I recognize. 
we know our own motivations inside of to care and kindness and to help. That's the way we want to do it. We have to understand the pathology, every all of the anatomy, the biomechanics, the clinical exam, and we want to support each other to help each other to grow. And but we all have to recognize our own bias. Who's motivated by what factors and what is your own personal bias? My own personal bias is a bias of faith. I believe everyone deserves care. Um, not everybody believes that. And if it's a complicated problem with a little layer six problem, I'm going to try to spend as much time as I have to to understand it. There are systems and structures that don't allow that. And as time has become reduced, finances become reduced, and pressures have become more intense, it makes it more difficult to take care of all patients with that attitude. But it was my bias. It was my way of seeing the world. And I'm not sure that we have a situation that supports that. But you have to understand each patient's unique layers and the involved complexity. And the only way we can do that is to understand it through the sequence of anatomy and biomechanics through clinical examination. And we do have to have our colleagues. It's a multi-specialty team to be able to approach these pathologies to understand the intrinsic factors. And we expect our colleagues to challenge us. If somebody says that a posterior femoral cutaneous nerve is a major injury on the backside of the hip, but a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is not on the front, we expect these type of challenges to occur. We may not agree with it. We may not agree with each other. And that's expected challenge. We want that. Um, but there's not a common language that exists between open surgeons, uh, uh, pelvic surgeons. If we talk about what if influences sagittal plane balance occur in hip replacement versus spine surgery, uh, and these all have influences on impingement and instability. So if we don't understand sagittal plane balance, we're not going to understand either direction, either side of the equation, but we have to be aware of it, and we have to be able to communicate our ideas. Otherwise, we're going to have conflict. And that conflict is going to, to undermine the ability to advance the field. That's a problem. So next factors. The intrinsic factors are more expected, accepted. But here's the problem. We have a new evolving problem that's happening in the world. We have the problem here that is extrinsic to us, things that we're not trained for. Understanding insurances. Insurances can say you're overutilizing, you know, resources to understand torsion, even though we know torsion is an influence on terminal hip extension or flexion, terminal flexion to produce labral pathology. You can say intrapelvis for a deep gluteal space problem, a 3T MRI. And then they can say, well, those you're not using resources properly. And then you can be claimed as fraudulent for your, your recommendations for evaluation. This is wrong. This is wrong. We're on the tip of an evolving field, and we have to have the liberty to be able to understand the pathology adequately to address the patient complaint. And that requires a hospital that, has, that needs support. Well, the, the hospital doesn't make any money, so they're not going to support it. So they, they have no reason to do it because there's no money for them. And the people that are leading the hospitals are people that don't have, that don't take an oath on the number one. Some have a great hearts, but they don't have the finance to be able to back it. So next, we have a legal. We have a legal problem uh, that the lawyers will sit and tell, tell the patient that there was something done wrong. Well, there's nothing done wrong. It's just that we can treat, we cannot cure this disease. We can treat this disease and make people better. We cannot cure it. Um, and that leads to things in the US where you have homicide. The patients get upset. We can't take care of things. We have, from the other way, we have the surgeons. They have a suicide uh, when they can't, they get whatever the problem is. So there's a violence back toward them. This raises a question of government. The government says, so what's going on here? You're spending too much money. Um, and I know some of, I know John, even in FAI during, back in those days, uh, hyper scrutiny from, you know, you know, government regulation looking through this was a problem. And then this, if we're able to address these things, it creates a turf war. We can do with the scope what you had to do with open or we can prevent total hip replacement. And what I'm surprised to see with our work on poster hip is sometime I believe you can prevent some of the spine pathology. So next slide one, I'll speed up here a little bit. I may not be able to go, I don't want you to go over. So we have time for a question, but these are, the, these are complex challenges. It requires a comprehensive understanding and all these things that we talked about with anatomy and biomechanics. 
And um, but I just want to say about this last one, I see that there's a problem that sometimes in some fields that, you know, where we don't understand things, then this lack of understanding between hip, spine, pelvic, pelvic core surgeons, because we don't have an understanding of anatomy, biomechanics, and clinical examination and have this interrelated working ship, you know, uh, relationship, uh, then th sometimes in, in some cultures, then they just make up for what is lack and missing with ego. And in the early days of the field of hip preservation, there was no ego. And the reason this field is because you have humble people that were leadership like uh, John and like Tom and Tom Bird and Mark and people that had open and open heart to try to understand and help these patients and include others in the, in the process. And that's why the field is where it's at. It's made the progress, not just because of the technology, not just because we understand it better, but because we had collaboration with open leadership. So we can't get, be ego centric uh, for missing data and get and lead to entrenchment through the open surgeon or whoever it is. Next slide. I'll try to speed up just a little bit. You can go to the next one. I want to give just a little analogy here. Go back to the, the last one. So, you know, I've had a chance just recently to be able to stomp around in the backwoods myself just a little bit. And I, I took some classes about understanding how you travel in the back country and what could it teach us about uh, the hip and hip preservation? Because it's hard to understand this intrinsic extrinsic thing. The intrinsic factors are what's the slopes. The slope on the left, um, you know, is, is a dragon's tail. It's one of the most famous things at SS Park to ski. It's an isolated train. And you can stomp up on this, 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 this little dragon's tail. They're almost the same slope on the left as to the right in the trees. But the slope on the left is isolated terrain. It's a single track through the snow protected on both sides and it's pretty safe. The one on the right side is interconnected terrain. It's interconnected because the snow is piled all the way across the face of that mountain. And if you go ski the ridge on the right, you come down through that area, you can wind up in an avalanche field. And it's the same slope, different terrain. One's interconnected and one is not. I will tell you that as hip preservationists, we ski interconnected terrain because of the hip, spine, pelvic core. And anything that we do on the hip, but we need to record the spine. It's interconnected. Let's go to the next slide. This is one of the intrinsic factors here for uh, you know, challenging fields. This is a little slope like I used to, to love to ski. Um, you know, it's, um, it's gentle, it looks gentle. It's just about 35, 40 degrees. And um, you look at your own personal source motivation. Do I understand it? My bias to this. And, but this is a type of slope because it's interconnected, you have to be aware on. So take a look at this next one. You'd think something like this, you've got lots of things to look at inner, inner, in, to study this. Like we have x-rays, we know the intrinsic factors. We say, this is the version, this is the alpha angle, this is the cam shape, this is the, <laughs> this is the acetabulum. And can I ski this terrain? Maybe, uh, you, you, you might be able to. Uh, good day, acceptable risk, you know, the right team. You know, there's very few, you know, to ski this ridge, there's very few extrinsic factors, but you know, you've got to be aware. This looks steeper, more deadly. Uh, like you ski that, you're gonna, you're, you just gotta be on your edge, you gotta be on it. But is this, is, is this a risk to you as the surgeon? No, it's not gonna be any risk or to the person who's in that area. Next slide. Coming, coming closer here. I just want to say, hang fires the bit of snow. So you're stomping around up there and your partners just get caught or you see somebody down below you that gets caught in a big avalanche. You know what they teach in the avalanche schools? They teach, is the field safe to enter? Is the posterior hip safe to enter? Is hip arthroscopy safe to enter? It depends. Everything is changing. Society is changing. There are a lot of factors extrinsically that are not the same as the intrinsic factors. Hang fire is the amount of snow that's above the slope that's left after an avalanche. So if you see somebody and we're rescuers, we go and rescue people out of avalanches every day. Every day we take people that are caught and we pull them out. But the problem that I would say about this is that we don't consider the extrinsic factors. 
We just say, can we get this person out without any consideration to what it, the risk to us personally? They don't do that in other fields, not even in basic life support. Is it safe for me to go do basic life support for this patient? Is it safe for me to enter this field? And I want to tell you, the risk to ourselves to take care of highly complicated people, highly complicated people in this era, we have to be very, very careful because of the hospital system, because of the legal structure, because of the insurance, because of the governmental oversight, because of the violence that goes on in the internet against doctors or in their office. We have to consider something that we have never considered before. And I'm the last person that would I think to say this. I'm not saying not care. I'm saying what we do to help. Can we jump into the avalanche field? Because sometimes we may find that the patients have a, a piece of rope connecting each other that we don't know about. They have lawyers saying, just stay in place. We'll bring you some hot chocolate. We have a hospital administrator say, we can't send the hospital. We can't send an, we can't send the helicopter. And, and that's, that, that's the problem. And then you have the government going, what's going on here? You know, the, this doctor is clearly the problem where it's the entire system that's the problem. It's not the doctor in there entering the avalanche field, trying to get complicated disease uh, patients out and be healed. So that's what I think that, that, that sort of, is this field safe to enter? That's my question. Let's go to the next one. When I first started doing endoscopic sighting nerve decompression, it was just a part of what I did for FAI. It was not anything different. A lot of my cases had FAI, they had hamstring syndrome, they had other things. We had fairly good outcomes, not perfect. But the difference between a, somebody functioning with a 55 Harrisip score and 78 is a big deal. Not working, can't live, can live. Other people, including Bernardo, had we improved to you know some pretty we made twenty point scores that, that people improved, but that's even without recognizing interpelvis problems or secondary deep gluteal syndrome, which I'm sure I missed. I think probably others, but we got people better, but we did not cure them, as John Christopher Eddy says, they're better but not all better. And who's responsible for the not all better? That's what we have to be aware of because it's getting to be a challenging and extrinsic environment where not like it was when I started, even in 91, when we're taking care of uh, World War II and, and military people all then. This is a different question. Can we get them? And a lot of patients are reporting or people are reporting from 80 improvement to 100. That's great, but it's a different class of patient than 50 to 78. That's just a different group of people. Next slide one. So we looked at posterior pathology as a model. We looked at what's affecting the low back. It's almost bigger when we did the lesser trochanteric uh, based on the biomechanics model that you had published this in arthroscopy. Let's go to the next one. We looked also on lesser trochplasty um, and femoral derotation. Both of them are hip extension based losses that doesn't allow the hip to move properly and it affects the spine. It's bigger, it's almost bigger effect in the, in the ODI uh, sometimes than, than it is with um, the hip scores uh, to fix the hip. And we need, to, we need to be tracking that. Next slide. So, you know, here's, is it safe to enter the avalanche field to rescue this patient? Can we do it today? Can we go into the poster hip without understanding comprehensively the anatomy, the biomechanics, the clinical examination, the diagnostic strategies? the way we have in the past, in the early days of, of when we were first getting, we cannot. And eight out of 10 good or excellent result today is not adequate to keep, not the patient safe, the surgeon. The surgeon will not, will be destroyed if you operate on people and get an eight out of 10 result. The resistance to propagating the advancement of the field and to take on these challenging cases we're not supported by the hospital. We're shot at by the government and the lawyers. I can tell you that this, the field has changed. It's not safe for those who are rescuing to go in surgically try to help. Everyone has to care with their hearts and all their effort, but to do the surgery, you only getting an eight out of 10 result is today, not enough. Not, I think some patients would accept it, 
but they say that, but they will not. And so we have to be careful uh, to enter the field. So I've got two nice slopes here. The one is just a nice walk along a field underneath the trees on the snow. That's a nice way to go. So you climb up into the steep mountains, uh, you take on difficult pathologies, and you can pay the price yourself. So I know that very well. So let's go to the next one. And this is what I wanted to say about the intrinsic, just, you know, I don't, I don't want to take too much more time, but personal motivation, you know, there's a spiritual uh, component, you know, that we, we all want to try to help people. And so you have to look at your own bias. We need to understand the patient's unique layers, the ABCs. Uh, we need colleagues in each of these different fields to help us understand these pathologies comprehensively, uh, to articulate our ideas. Uh, we have to be careful about the absence of common language or when we're talking about even our complications with that morbidity mortality conferences anymore, uh, about what, what we're calling major and minor complications. Let's go to the next one. And um, so in sharing my experience, I just want to say, always care, always make a good comprehensive diagnosis, understand the anatomy, the biomechanics and the clinical. But I would, at this time in history, I would be very careful about taking on anything that gets you an eight out of 10, uh, good or excellent. M MCIDs at 75, 85, nine even, you're still gonna have a one out of 10 chance of somebody's being dissatisfied because they're, they're better, but not all better. And that puts a risk to you and your entire family. Let's take to the next. So in summary, the preservation field is correct to avoid entering this avalanche terrain with the risk to the rescuer too great at this point in history. Maybe it will change in the future as we address these extrinsic factors. But if we don't, don't go there. It's too, it's, there's, it's too, much, uh, it's too much on the rescuer. The time, the complexity, the lack of support, the cultural orientation are against us. Uh, eight out of 10 is no longer adequate. We have to recognize extrinsic factors are bigger than the intrinsic. And it requires us though, to continue to develop our understanding of anatomy and biomechanics and the clinical diagnostics so that when the opening arises again, if we can get the extrinsic factors under control, maybe it's not this way all around the world, but it is here. When the extrinsic factors are under control again, we'll be ready to push this thing to the next level. But this isn't like in 1990, when I started in practice, things are different, a lot different. And so we need to check the ego at the door. And I've got, and the next thing that's coming up is this hip spine pelvic core. And it is big. This interconnectedness and the loss of terminal hip extension is bigger than we expected one. It's much bigger as we started to look at the clinical data put on top of the biomechanics data that we did. And this is probably going to say, it's just that how much time and experience we have to have to understand that. I think it will develop, it's gonna to have to have its own specialty. It's gonna to have to have a fellowship committed to the understanding of the interrelationship of this interconnected terrain. Just like you would have to, if you're gonna be a mountain guide, you have to understand all the mountains, not just the chutes where they're safe, but the interconnectedness of the whole thing. And we have to be aware that it's this, uh, you, can, you can just operate, you can just operate on one layer and think you're a hip surgeon or a neurosurgeon or whoever, that you don't understand the whole entirety of it or an inner pelvis surgeon. You need to understand all the layers involved. If we don't, uh, the patients will not be served. Last little slide. So I think all my colleagues, but I, I guess my last slide didn't come up. That's okay. But that's it uh, for tonight. I thank my family and Juan, I thank you and everybody for staying late. I apologize for taking a, a little too much of everybody's time. Oh, it was perfect. Actually, I, I paid a pretty, yeah, yeah, it was pretty attentive to, to your uh, conference. And I, I could say, well, you, in the summary will be good faith is not enough, uh, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't treat these patients. You just have to make sure it's safe to go. And it's not just about the anatomy and biomechanics or the complexity of the problem itself, but also the personality of the patient and the context of the case. Uh, so the, the takeaway will be be trained, properly trained, 
use the the right tools because you cannot do deep gluteal space in a obese patient with short cannulas or short lenses. So be sure you have the the right tools and get company like the analogies you were showing in the in the snow. So if you if you think it's too high level for you, you just get your ego down and call someone else that knows how to to map or to walk around that area and and you will be good i i always say to my students that there are two kinds of patients the first one after surgery will say i'm pretty excited i i am 90 percent better and the other patient will be i am pretty discouraged i have still 10 percent of my pain and it's the same patient so it's important to 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 know the patient pretty well don't make a decision in these cases until you know the patient pretty well in several appointments and 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 just take the advices from the experts so i don't know if we have time for questions the doctor mosquera tenemos tiempo para unas unos comentarios de cierre o ya hemos excelente impresionante todo lo que hemos escuchado eh, ¿Qué horas son? Porque el tema es la traductora que no sé si tú. No, oh, so so we're good. So uh, I want to thank from the bottom of, of my heart to Dr. Hal Martin, Dr. Samson, and Dr. O'Donnell for accepting this invitation. It is important for us in Latin America to to listen to you and to learn from you, the people who made history with this field. And please uh, stay in touch. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Aguilera, algún comentario final para cerrar? Okay, Juan, yo creo que que este es el el fin de la del del webinar agradeciendo a todos los asistentes y eh, esperamos que el próximo webinar sea igual o mejor. Bueno, buenas noches. Gracias a todos. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the speakers Thank you as well. Juan for for your work and thank you to everybody. Gracias a todo Latinoamérica, Asia, Europa, Norteamérica por estar con nosotros. Gracias. Bye bye. Gracias a Carl. Thank you. Bye bye.